In this lesson, we're going to get a chance to connect two ideas, orbital notation and the actual shape of orbitals inside the electron cloud of an atom. It's important to understand how the two ideas come together. The separate ideas tell us things that the other one can't, and so to put them together gives us a greater whole than the two ideas separately. Looking at this particular homework assignment, the reason we get to this sort of shorthand version here, or we actually use this shorthand version, this is the complete orbital notation. This is the complete electron configuration. And this is kind of the shorthand version, also called the kernel electron configuration because the noble gas is the kernel, uh, not C-O-L-O-N-E-L. -E we kind of mispronounce that in the United States. It's colonel, but we pronounce it kernel, like K-E-R-N, -E, which is what this is, kernel, okay? Like the kernel of a corn or something. So the kernel, a kernel of corn. But this is also called the noble gas electron configuration because we put in the noble gas to replace uh, this much of the um, electron configuration from the complete electron configuration up to 3p6 because this this part here is the orbital notation for argon. So we just replace all that with argon. And the, what, what that gives us is just the part of the orbital notation that is involved in bonding. And since we're dealing with chemistry here, that's what's really important to us, the part that's involved in bonding. In particular, the highest energy level. Although the D sub level is also sometimes involved, we're primarily interested in what's going on up here in the highest energy level, 4s in this case, and 4p, okay? So that gives us five valence electrons. Although arsenic and other elements that are in this category can use these D sublevel electrons. That's why that's sort of in there and why it kind of helps to do this. We can see what's really important to us when we're talking about bonding. For us, we're really going to be worried about 4S and 4P, okay? 3D will be involved, but that only comes along once in a while. We don't have to worry about it too much, okay? If I were bonding with lead, we'd look at 4, 6S and 6P. That's four valence electrons. This 4F and 5D, we don't really care about so much, especially not 4F. 5D can be involved, but primarily it's 6S, especially with lead, it's just 6S and 6P that are involved in bonding, okay? So what we're going to do here is we're going to, write, we're going to look at what's happening in the valence level uh, and, 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 and the way that the orbitals are actually arranged. So this is just a sort of mapping system or um, inventory system for keeping up with where electrons are. It doesn't really tell us what the shape of these orbitals are or what the shape of the sublevels are. The shape of the sublevels really is almost inconsequential. What really matters is the shape of the orbitals themselves. The shape of the sublevel has to do with the shape of the orbitals. So what I want to look at is 6s and 6p, or if it were this in our it would be 4s and 4p, and look at the actual shape. And that's what your balloons are for today. Okay? So if I have if I'm looking at the valence level of electrons, the um, let's see, here's our, let's do this, let's do it this way, here's our um, nucleus, and we're only going to look at that valence level, whatever the highest energy level is. And so, um, if we're at the S sub level, um, has the same shape, volume, arrangement, if you will, um, as the sublevel itself. So S is, and, and the primary level for um, the sixth level is a sphere, okay? So this is the S sublevel. All right, got it? And so that's also the shape of the orbital. S sublevels, as we can see here, only have one orbital. See, this is an S sublevel that has one orbital. This is an S sublevel that has one orbital. So it's a sphere, okay, and that's, the, that's its shape. It's synonymous, uh, geometrically synonymous with the actual primary energy level, okay? Now inside that, then, we've got P sublevels. P sublevels are made of um, shapes that are technically mushroom heads. I'll show you what that means in a minute. We usually think about it in high school chemistry as being sort of this. Okay, so there is one P orbital. Just one of them. All right? Technically, it's just the top half, or the top part of it, actually. I don't even know if it's the top half. It's the top part of it. So in reality, this part here and here these parts don't exist. It's just this part and this part that really exist. But it's hard enough for students to think about it, the shape of these things. So we most of the time think of it as being kind of a double balloon shape. Okay? So that's one p orbital. And then we've got three of those p orbitals. 
if we look at the orbital notation, we can see we've got three p orbitals. That's why we draw it out this way. And the second p orbital is going to be 90 degrees to the first one. Okay, and again, it's just the top part of it. That's actually the orbital itself. Okay, so this part and this part are part of the same orbital. All this stuff doesn't exist, and these are, this is, it looks like two part, two things, but it's not two things. Okay, it's two antinodes, but it's all part of the same orbital. Okay, these are two antinodes, all part of the same orbital. Both of these are p orbitals, okay? Um, if we were looking at the, in the case of arsenic, we might say that's, that's 4p, okay? So we could call, in this case, we'd call this, um, this p here. Since you're used to, in high school, of thinking about the horizontal axis being x, so if you can imagine a, a needle going through this whole thing like this, okay, this would be p on the x-axis. Does that make sense? And this one up here would be p on the y-axis, right? Okay, when you start really doing things in three dimensions, we actually have a different um, thought process for what those axes are supposed to be. All right, then, we need another p orbital. And this p orbital has to come out this way toward you and go back behind everything as well. And that's a little bit harder to visualize. Okay, I'm going to kind of do it like this. All right, and then you got this part that's going back behind over here. All right, and really this is almost hard to see what's going on because this is this part right here this pink part is in front of the green and orange part so let's kind of make part of that a dotted line so you can tell that it's a little more maybe but that it's in that it's behind or I'm sorry I'm not doing the wrong one I should be doing the green one that's behind not the pink one that's behind and my whiteout doesn't want to work for me this morning for some reason I need to go buy some more white out or see if I've got some more in my drawer over there or something. Okay, and then this back here is behind that. Does that help you visualize what's going on a little bit better? Once I kind of clear it up by redrawing my orange and or uh, let's see, those are right. Redrawing this right here, the, the pink line. That should be in the front. How's that? To help you see what's going on? Still kind of hard, isn't it? Well, that's the reason for having balloons. Now, we're not going to be do making a balloon model of the S orbital. I didn't label that. This is S. Okay. And I didn't label this as being PZ here. Let's do that. PZ. And since PZ is kind of hard to visualize here, I'm going to do it this way, okay? We're going to be making balloon models of this. We're going to make mo models of the P orbitals, but not the S, okay? If I could uh, make a big round ball and stick these, you know, six balloons inside of it, we'd do that, okay? But I don't, you can't do that, okay? There is a way to do that, but we're not going to try to do it for everybody here. It's a little bit, a little bit too cumbersome to do that. It's hard enough to do the balloons. Some students have a hard time blowing up balloons and tying them. Okay, but anyway, I don't know why. So what you're going to do first is to blow up two balloons. I don't care what color you start with, but the two balloons you start with must be the same color. Okay? You can start with green, you can start with blue, you can start with purple. I don't care. Just find two balloons of the same color. That is to say round, or sometimes they're called party balloons, or students have a problem with round because it's not really round. Okay? It's more of a teardrop shape once you blow it up. But blow up two balloons, blow them up the same size, and tie knots in both got it? So do that first and we'll come back to this uh, the illustration here in just a moment and see how to put it all together. Just to help you a bit, don't try to blow them up as big as they'll get. It's harder to tie knots in them when you get them as big as they can be, okay? You know, leave them not quite completely blown up, you know, you see what I'm saying? It'll be easier to tie knots in them when you do. 
So some people have a little bit tough time with the balloons. Okay. All right. So here's a balloon, and it's just a simple knot. Okay. You're going to kind of do. I can show it on camera here. Make a loop like that and push this through here. Okay. Hope you can see what I'm doing. And so there's one balloon that's blown up. You need a second one. So I'll find a second one here. Same color balloon. I want it about the same size so you can see maybe that this is not quite the same size yet. And you know, if they're not absolutely perfectly the same size or quite exactly the same shape, it's okay. All right, again, I'm making a loop here. All right, and I'm sticking the little end of the balloon through that loop and pulling it down tight. Okay. And then we're going to tie these two balloons together. Okay, now that means you've got to tie what amounts to a square knot. Okay, now those of you who are Boy Scouts, maybe you're good at this, maybe not. They don't, they don't spend as much time with tying knots as we used to when I was in Boy Scouts, okay? But it's kind of like tying your shoe without the bunny ears. Y'all know what I mean by that? Yeah. So you go around once, okay? And then you're going to take and go back through this to tie a knot and put them together. All right, that makes sense to everybody? Now, if you have a Sharpie, get it out. If you don't have a Sharpie, that's okay. You can use, you can use, uh, you know, board markers like I have up here. Okay, and I want you to draw a dotted line around the balloon like this, so that you're showing where the actual part of the orbital is. Okay, see what I'm doing? There's your dotted line. It needs to go all the way around. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, just kind of got to get the idea that we're talking about the top half. Now, once we've got the top half with the center there, we want to label this. Okay, so this is a P orbital. I'm going to label it P. All right, now do you want to call this X, Y, or Z? X. X, okay. I have a, here a vote for X. So this is P, X. Well, if this is P, X, this is also going to be px on the other end. So let me dot it, do a dotted line around this. Okay, and this is also px. Okay, so I've got that labeled px as well. Okay, now. I don't know if you remember when you were in physical science, you were talking about waves and what the parts of a wave are. This actually represents a wave. I know it doesn't look like a wave, but it is a wave. Okay? This is the antinode, and the node is right here. Okay? I know that seems kind of strange, but that's what it is. All right? The node and antinode. So these are two antinodes for the wave. Okay? So what I want to do is to label this end over here, antinode 1. Okay, antinode 1, and I'm going to go over the other end and call it antinode 2. Spelling B, Papa, how do you spell antinode? Well, anti is A-N-T-I, okay. node is N-O-D-E. Oh, yeah, Pretty much the way it sounds, okay? So that is one of your three P orbitals, okay? So now you got to blow up uh, another set of balloons, two balloons of the same color, Okay, different color than this though. Mine is purple, so I can't blow up another set that's purple. I've got to blow up a set that's green or pink or yellow or something. Okay, so blow up another set, label it as well. Only this time it's not going to be PX. The next set needs to be PY if you want to. Okay, and the third set is going to be PZ. Both of them will have an antinode one and an antinode two. Okay, and dotted lines. So you're going to make three separate sets, and then I'll tell you how to put them together. Okay, three separate sets. I'll show you how to put them together after you do that. Okay, one note is these all these balloons are about, about the same size. Okay. Okay. 
All right, so uh, here is one of the p orbitals. Here's another p orbital, okay? And I'm going to put them together like this, and they're kind of, I'm going to make it kind of flat. Okay, see how it's kind of flat? And I'm going to take my third one and simply stick it right in here, okay? Right in there, like that, okay? And there's a set of p orbitals. You, your balloons that have the same color have to be on opposite sides. So my two purple ones on the opposite sides, my two blue ones on the opposite sides, green ones on the opposite sides. Okay? And that's a model of how the P orbitals actually go together. Okay, the last thing I want to have you guys do is to get you about a meter of string. We're going to make a lasso. Okay? First thing I want to do is just make a little loop right here, a little bunny here like you're tying your shoes. Okay? And just tie a little knot here on the end. Just make a knot like this, okay? And if we just take those string and loop it back through, that we've got a lasso. And if you take your balloon model and lasso one balloon, and get it to go around here, there we go. Lasso one balloon and snug it up now you got something you can carry around with you all day long and show it to all your peers and all your teachers and take it home and show it to your mom and dad and hang it up in your room and you will never forget what P orbitals look like, right? Or P sub level. See? Now, don't bust these balloons in the building, okay? You actually can get, a lot of get in a lot of trouble for busting balloons in the building. Just saying. All right? I'd rather you take them home, okay? so that uh, you've got them hanging up and you can remember what they look like. All right, it's gonna help you get ready for tests when you do that. Now, it's important that you know how this three-dimensional shape fits together with our concept of orbitals in orbital notation. You understand what I'm saying? All right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is show you how these three-dimensional shapes fit with orbital notation. All right, can I get everybody's attention for a minute? Always. Okay, so I want to take a fairly simple atom that has a P sublevel and an S sublevel and write the orbital notation and show you how these connect together, okay? You need to know how they are similar, where, where the pieces fit together. So let's see, how about we do, well, let's, yeah, sulfur. We'll do sulfur, okay? So sulfur has a symbol of S, and we got a colon there, and we got a box for the first one S orbital and two electrons, and two S, and two electrons, and two P. And then three S, and three P. And so sulfur has one, two, three, four electrons in that 3P sublevel. Okay, in the third row of the periodic table, P sublevel region, there's S, and so one, two, three, and come back and pair up in the first orbital. Okay, so in this illustration here, if this is the valence level we're talking about, and that's the only one we really care about primarily when we're talking about uh, chemistry, what's going on in chemistry, then this S sublevel is represented by that box right there. Does that make sense? And this, uh, let's see, PX is green. So it doesn't really matter which one of these three boxes represents that, okay? Most of the time we say this is X, Y, and Z, but that doesn't matter because we're talking about three dimensions, guys. If this is up and this is sideways and this is in and out, well, if, I turn it up, if I turn it this way, now this is up. And in three-dimensional space, you know what? Up doesn't matter. If you're an astronaut, up doesn't matter anymore, okay? Because, you know, up there, up does, there's no gravity or there's no effect of gravity on you. Uh, there is gravity. That's what's keeping the space shuttle from flying off into outer space and away from the Earth. But anyway, the point is that this is not, these are relative to each other, X, Y, and Z, not specifically up is Y and horizontal is X, okay? So it doesn't really matter which one represents that. Uh, I'm going to say that this one represents X, 
And so I'm going to go put an arrow to this node, or this anti-node, and to this anti-node, okay? And let's see, for Y, I'll call this one one of the Y, so I'm going to take and put an arrow to this, and to that, okay? Because that's what it represents. And then, then this last one over here is going to be um, the pink one, okay? So for that, it's going to be even tougher to get, get my arrows in there. So why not, I'll do something really funky here and go like that and like that. How about that? Okay. You see what I'm saying? So these things don't show three-dimensional shapes. This is the three-dimensional shape we're talking about here. These only show how many electrons are in what orbital and what spin and that sort of thing. So this actually shows a little more than this does because this doesn't show spin, okay, in one respect. But this shows more than this does in one respect because it shows actual shape. You with me? So you need to know that. Now, having shown you that, then let's talk a little about this element cube that you have to get finished, okay? So if you go to... And I hope you've already done all this, but if you go to uh, Google Classroom and you open up your element cube blank and you save your element cube blank to your computer, I'll download it here to my computer, and I'll have to go find it. Let me see here. It should be in my downloads, I hope. Hope, I hope, I hope. Element cube blank for web. All right, bring that up. All right, and so you need to work with this in Word. If you work with this directly into in Google Docs or something, it's not going to give you the right format. Okay, it's going to come out all, all weird. This is an example here of what your element cube. Uh, should look like. Lots of interesting stuff on most of these sides. But when we get down here to your element cube, you're going to change the element symbol. You're going to change the atomic number. You're going to change the name. Please do not capitalize the name. Okay? Not that it matters a lot because, you know, it's like the first word of sentence or title. But I want to emphasize that this is not uh, a proper noun. So keep your element name for our periodic table lowercase. Got it? And then the uh, atomic number, or the atomic mass, rather, average atomic mass goes down here. Okay, now, for this section here, you're going to have to have um, orbital notation. And because some of these orbital notations are really, really long and too long to actually fit on this side of the cube, for this element cube project only, not on tests, not on quizzes, not on homework, you're allowed to do a shorthand version of orbital notation. Okay? There really isn't a shorthand version. There's only a shorthand version of electron configuration. But for this, we're going to use a shorthand version. So let's see. What, what I do? I did while ago. Oh, here's sulfur. So let's take this is the um, this part between my fingers. Oh, I'll get on the camera here. This part between my fingers here is the orbital notation for the next lowest noble gas for sulfur. That would be neon. And so I'm going to basically take this part and make it neon. And here's where I'm going to write it. I'll bring it back, bring up, bring back up the element cube here. And I'll type in S and uh, where's the brackets? I'm missing it in my eyes. Here we go. Brackets N E. And then I, to do the orbital notation, I just go up here and find out what do I need of these up here and copy and paste. Okay. So, I need, first of all, and a full, you know, with um, orbital here for an S orbital, okay? So, I'm gonna go, let's go back over here to the cube. I'll show you that again. I'll get back to it. So, I'm going to copy this one right here. That one's full. has two, two, two arrows in it. I'm going to copy it. Go down here and leave a little bit of space and paste it. Well, I don't want one S. I actually want, in this case... 3s. So I'm just going to change that to 3, and there, there that is, okay? And I can make this a little bit bigger if I want to. Oh, I don't want the whole thing bigger. Let's go back. Okay, and just make just these two things right here a little bigger. There we go. All right, not necessary, but I like to do that for me. 
And then I want, uh, going back to where I did this, so I need a full one for th with 3P, a half full, half full for 3P. So I'll go back over here. And I need a full one to start with, so I'll click this one here. Copy. Paste. I need a half full one. Copy. I need two half full ones, actually, so I'm going to put those in there. Now, these last two here, I don't need any kind of symbols at the bottom. I'm going to just take, just take, click and take those out. And this one, I need to change it from 1S to 3P. Okay. And I have open notation. I don't know why that's staying highlighted. It's not supposed to be highlighted. There you go. Okay. That makes sense? So you got to have orbital notation, you got to have electron configuration in this box, and you also have to, and you need to label it too. I didn't label it. Say this is the orbital notation, okay? And label it. This is the electron configuration. We also need to talk about um, the ion symbols, okay, for your element. Now, a lot of these elements that you have, these really larger elements down here near the bottom of the periodic table, let me show you that. Okay, these are not going to have ions because they're pretty much unknown. Okay, we don't know what their ions would be if we were able to do anything with them because they're not around long enough to do any bonding. Okay, but all these other elements at the top, they're going to have ions, and you're going to have to list their ions. Okay, so let's go back here to the cube, and I'm going to I'm going to skip over. Most of you are going to put electron configurations next. I'm going to skip over that and just put in the ion symbols. Okay, so ions. Well, if I can type right or sulfur R. I can't spell sulfur, can I? S-U-L. Okay. All right. Sulfur. There we go. That's faster. Mm -hmm. So it, I'm going to have an S and then I want to tell, say what the charges are for that sulfur. Okay. Now, um, I gave you a little help here by giving you in your packet for homework purposes this periodic table here, which actually has all the charges possible listed for you. Okay. All right. Now, technically, technically, sulfur only has one ion. And it almost never becomes an ion, but it could be an ion. But we're going to list both of these as if they're both possible ions of sulfur. Okay. That's all I want you to do. So we go back over here to our thing, and I want to say, okay, one of those two charges is 4 plus. But it needs to be a superscript. Ion charges and what are called oxidation numbers need to be superscripts. So I'm going to highlight that. Oh, just highlight 4 plus if I can get it to do that. There we go. And I've got on my computer, it already set up so I can click that, okay? You don't have to do that, but if you, it makes it a lot faster if you do. What you can simply do is click on font here, and it's going to give you the choice of making a superscript right here. Okay? So that made it a superscript. Now I'm going to go back, and there's also a shortcut for that, and I forget, it's different for Google. Uh, I think, let's see. Um, that's not it. Let's see. Control plus. Nope. Control. Well, that didn't do it either, did it? Okay. Let's see, go back and go back again. Where am I? Okay, and let's see, uh, maybe it's Control Alternate Plus? Nope. Hmm. Well, there is a shortcut, I just forget what it is. I used to use it a lot, but since I use Google so much now, it's a different set of keystrokes for that. Hmm? Say what now? Oh yeah, if I click that and click this, I have a superscript button already. Right there. Yeah, I did that. Oh, it says it. Control Shift Plus. So Control. That's what it is. Control Shift and Plus. And there, there's a superscript. Okay. Yeah, popped up there. There you go. So that's a shortcut. You could simply go font and change it, but you, you, you know, it kind of helps to get used to that. With Google, I think it's um, Google Docs. It's like. Con control period or something. I forget which one it is. I'm so used to doing it on there. I just don't even think about it anymore. Well, the key keystrokes for shortcuts are a little bit different for the two. All right. There you go. So that's that's your ion symbol. Now, sulfur actually has two of them. So I'm going to make 
put a comma in between. I'm, I'm going to put a comma in between, maybe. I don't want a superscript comma, so I'm going to go back and change that back from that and then put in my next ion symbol. Okay? Does that make sense? If you have an element that doesn't have any ion things, like... You just say that. Just say that? Yeah, you just say that there's no known ions for this element. Okay? So, you know, you might want to look it up somewhere and be sure. Okay? And um, you have to be careful about uh, Wikipedia because it's possible for people to fool Wikipedia. They're better than they used to be. They can, people can put bogus stuff on Wikipedia or people can write something that's you know, kind of not well known and nobody will catch it for a long time. Um, I'm, finally, somebody will catch it, which is the point. But just be careful about looking, on, looking up stuff on Wikipedia. If you go to a university website, you're probably going to get a much better result somewhere, but sometimes stuff like this you won't find it on, Wiki on a university website because it's a little bit too rudimentary for them. Okay, But that's the way you're going to do this. And then you'll be ready to do your element cube. Okay, So, since tomorrow we're going to do a lab, and I want you to get ready for the lab. For this class, on in this year, for right now, uh, you guys are going to have uh, two days to finish up your element cube. So today's Tuesday, you'll have to Thursday to get it done. All right. That means on Thursday. You need to have both your elements done, both your element cubes done, cut out, paste it up before you walk into here. Okay? If you want to bring it by before school, you can do that, and then, then you won't have to worry about carrying it around all day, and it may be being crushed in your book bag or something. But uh, don't come in here expecting to get my scissors and my glue and glue up your cube and get full credit for it. That's not going to happen. Have it done before you come in that day. You can come in before school and put it on the board, you'll get full credit. Okay? But if you wait to the last second and try to do it in class, you know, you're going to lose points on that. And it's kind of a shame to lose five, 10 points because you didn't glue it up, you know? Get it cut out and bring it in, okay? If you want to get it, if you want to do it in here, you know, you can cut it out and glue, and you can come in here tomorrow and glue it up, okay, after class or after school or before school or something, but don't do it on the day it's due, all right? So the question is, what do you do about elements on, as far as the shorthand? if you're on the first row and really the second row too because there's not much reason to write a shorthand for elements on the first two rows okay it's <laughs> don't do shorthand versions of um, orbital notation or electron configuration for elements on the first two rows okay just don't do it got it all right so if your your element is on the third row or further down you can use shorthand versions okay if you're on the first two rows if you're doing beryllium or oxygen or fluorine, no shorthands for those orbital notations or electron configurations. It's kind of almost ridiculous to write hydrogen in a bracket instead of writing 1s2. You know? It's like, why, why, why go through all that effort? It's, it's just as easy to do one as the other. Any other questions? That's a good question. Thank you. So, um, We've been talking about orbital notation and electron configurations. And once you do a orbital notation and electron configurations, electron dot formula should be like super easy. Okay? Um, all you have to do is identify the valence electrons. And we just talked about how to do that. We said if you're in, if you've got an orbital notation, okay, this is one of the orbital notations you're supposed to do for homework in this class and this year, this day, whatever. Uh, and we, we said that 4s and 4p are our valence electrons, so that's five valence electrons, okay? And for lead, it was uh, for 6s and 6p, that's four valence electrons, okay? And so for electron dot formulas, you simply draw the element symbol, and we're going to count the number of valence electrons. Well, let's start with arsenic. We said it had five valence electrons. We're going to put one dot for each electron, on each of four sides. Now, it doesn't matter which four sides you put it on. I could start up here or over here or down here. Doesn't matter, okay? What matters is if I have a one dot for one electron, another dot for another electron, another dot for another electron, another dot for another electron, okay? I could stop at two if I only needed two. I could stop at one if I only needed one, okay? Um, but I want you to imagine that there is a, not that you draw a square, but you imagine a square, okay? So here's a square around this arsenic. And so one dot in the middle of each of the four sides. Does that make sense? Okay? Now arsenic needs one more dot, 
So we're going to pair up on one of the four sides. And again, it doesn't matter which of the four sides. That's an electron, a, re a reasonable electron dot formula for arsenic. Okay? For hydrogen, there's just one dot. Okay? For helium, there are two dots. Now sometimes in some textbooks you'll see the first two dots paired together. Don't worry about it. Just put two dots on there, okay? Um, for lithium, I set my periodic table down somewhere. Forgot where I put it. Here we go. Lithium's located right here. So there's just one electron in this second row, second primary level. So lithium's going to have one electron dot. That makes sense? So electron dots are easy once you've got orbital notation electron configurations. Got it? Super easy, right? If this is hard, you're not paying attention. <laughs> Should be easy. We good? All right. So uh, let's see. Let's let's make, let's give you guys a homework where you write um, write uh, orbital notation, both kinds of electron configuration and electron dot formulas for calcium and Selenium. Okay, got that? That should be too hard, right? This is homework. Um, I can't promise, but because we have a lab tomorrow, we may not actually get to looking this over for tomorrow. So if it does, we don't do it tomorrow. It'll be due on Thursday. But it, you know, you got to know. I, I'd work on it while it's fresh in your mind. Okay, just saying, because otherwise you stand a chance of losing 10 points because you have it late. Got it?